Ladies, let's uh, look at the first uh, group of eukaryotes, okay, in our unit on diversity of living things. So, um, this group that I'm going to show you is, so the group is called protists, okay, so I think you guys are, are familiar with, like, what a plant is, uh, with what an animal is, probably even with what a fungi is, but probably very few of you have heard of this group, the protists. I want to point out one thing that you're going to learn in this unit are what are good groups and what are bad groups. Now, what I mean by that is uh, a good group is a group that when you look at everything inside the group are more like each other than things outside the group. If you recall, the group reptiles is not a good group unless we include birds. Because birds and crocodiles are more like each other than crocodiles are like lizards. So one of the things I want you guys to understand in this unit is what's a good group and what's a bad group. Okay, And you'll see that as we go through this presentation. So the word monophyletic, when you come across this word in this unit, that refers to a good group. The word, the prefix mono means what? One. So this means a uh, common ancestor, one common ancestor, and all of the descendants. If you, if it says anything other than that, that means it's not a good group. <laughs> the group that we'll be looking at today, the protists, is not a good group. And you'll see that when we go through this, okay? So we've been talking about, um, Eukaryotes. You, you have an idea what a eukaryote is, right? It's a cell that has what? A true, yeah, true nucleus. There's other things too, but that's the defining characteristic. The kingdom protist is a eukaryotic organism. Okay, so its cells contain, uh, its cells have nuclei, right? Here are some of the characteristics uh, of members in this group. But you'll notice what's really um, not very good about this is you get a lot of this, mostly some, okay? Uh, when you hear things like that, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Like if I said to you, mammals, do I say do I say that some mammals make milk? No, all mammals make milk, right? That's much clearer than something like, well, some do this, uh, a few are this, uh, most of them are like this. And when you see stuff like that, that tells you it's not a very good group, and you'll see that uh, as we go through this, okay? And you can see that many are here, some are, are asexual, so it's you know not a very good group. We talked about how uh, the eukaryotic cell actually evolved, right? So I don't need to go through this again. We talked about the theory of endosymbiosis, all right? So I'm, I'm going to skip over that because we already discussed that. Here are the groups. Now, this says the monophyletic groups. That means that these are considered to be good groups. But here's the funny thing. If you pick up the old grade 11 textbook, it's the, it's a red one, okay? Uh, by McGraw Hill. It did not divide the protists, or it did not divide, uh, this section in this way. It had a totally different way of dividing this kingdom, okay? This division is more modern. And I'll be honest with you, it could be different tomorrow, all right? But it's more accurate than the one you see in the old grade 11 textbook. This one has certain groups. You can see the groups here. Uh, so, for example, some you could recognize, plants, okay? I think that's probably the only one we could recognize. Some of the other ones are you know, a bit more tricky, but we can recognize some of the things in there, like fungi and, like, animals. Okay. Uh, here is a tree that shows these groups a bit more clearly. Okay. Again, we can recognize some of these groups. So, for example, you know, recognize plants. We can see here are animals and here are fungi. But you'll notice what's missing is the group that we are talking about today, protists, because it's not a good group. It's divided everywhere. Okay. So, in the old grade 11 textbook, they divided this kingdom into uh, animal-like protists, 
because they kind of behave like animals. Uh, fungal-like protists, because they behave like fungi. And plant-like protists, because they behave like plants. You don't see that here. Okay? And that's a really bad way of classifying things. You should not classify things based on what they may look like, because sometimes what they may look like is very misleading, right? Like if we said, let's classify things as fish-like things. Imagine we did that. What would a whale be then? A whale would be a fish-like thing, wouldn't it? So this is the way we're going to survey this, this group. Now, Let's talk about good groups and bad groups. If I said to you the group algae, okay? So let's zoom in a little bit, make it a little bit bigger here. Is algae a good group? Yes or no? What do you think? So here's algae here. So there's red algae over here. There's green algae over here. But then there's brown algae over here. So... Is algae a good group? The answer is no. Because you can see that brown algae are more like this thing called a water mold than a brown algae is like red or green algae. So that's not a good group. What about the group mold? Things that are molds, are they a good group? No, because we have some molds on this side. And then we have a water mold on that. So that's not a good group. So one of the things I want you to identify what's a good group, like mammals are a good group, but what's not a good group. Do you think fish is a good group? No? What do you think? Yeah, I did tell you it's not a good group, but did I ever tell you why? No? Okay, good, because we haven't talked about animals yet. And then you will see... That fish is not a good group either. Okay, so let's talk about some of these groups, okay? So, for simplicity's sake, a protist is anything that's not a plant, an animal, or a fungi. Okay? So if it's not a plant, animal, or fungi, it, it's a protist. Okay? So these protists are divided into certain groups. So here, for example... These are the groups. These are the characteristics of the groups. Uh, again, don't worry about memorizing all the little characteristics, okay? I want you to understand what I'm going to focus on, like the big things. So let's look at an example of a group, okay? Let's look at the first group. Let's look at a group called uh, the excavates, okay? And it says here that an excavate is a cell that probably has a missing mitochondria, probably, probably, not always, okay? So here's a picture of something called Giardia lamblia, okay? Now, do you see these two little circles here? Okay, you see these? One here, and maybe I shouldn't be using black. These are uh, two nuclei. They're haploid nuclei. Okay. Here's another picture of it. There are the two nuclei. Okay. So here is an example of an organism from this group. Now, oop, make this a little bit smaller. Here's just some information about this group. Okay. Uh, probably has no mitochondria, or the mitochondria is unusual in its shape, what it looks like. Okay. Here's some other characteristics. It says that Giardia is a parasite. Do you know what a parasite is? What is it? Okay, so um, just just for technicality, or a parasite is something that is considered to be something that lives off something else, right? But is a, a eukaryotic cell, or made up of uh, eukaryotic cells. So like viruses and bacteria. They can be parasitic in behavior, but they're not classified as parasites because they're not eukaryotic cells. Okay? So a parasite is something that it has eukaryotic cells in it. And so this thing would be an example of that. Now you'll notice that in this scheme, this group is the most different. It's the one that branches off first. 
So we have all of these other groups are more like each other than than this thing, right? Because you know how to read these trees, right? I, listen, you better know how to read these things because it's going to be on your test. So, for example, if I said to you, what is the thing that is most similar to a land plant on this tree? You would say it's the green algae, right? Okay. But if I said to you, okay, what's more similar to the, the land plant? Is it the uh, water mold? Or is it the amoeba on this side? So can you see the amoeba? What do you think? It's the water mold. Because look, water mold and land plant share this branch point, right? Land plant and amoeba share this branch point. Remember, the branch point that's further away from the, the you know, the this is like going back in time, right? <laughs> going up the tree is going forward in time. So this common ancestor is more recent than this common ancestor. Yeah, Sabrina. So what if you're going to say which one is more similar to the ancestor? Why or is it the algae? The same. They're the same because these two share the same branching point. Okay? So let's say we ask the question, uh, you know, are, what's more like a land plant? Um, let's say we ask the question, yeah, let's say we ask the question, um, water mold or, no, I already asked you that question. I don't want to answer that one again. Uh, let's say we said to you, okay, we look at fungi. Okay? Fungi over here. And we say, okay, ciliates over here. Okay? And now we say, um, this thing, an excavate. Is the ciliate more like the excavate, like Giardia that I just showed you? Or is the ciliate more like the fungi? Yeah. And be careful because even though you like, well, yeah, but the ciliate's like, like literally right beside it. But you can't look at it that way. You gotta look at the branch point. So the branch point between ciliates and fungi is here. But between fungi and this thing, it's over here. And between ciliates and this thing, it's still over here. So ciliates and fungi are more like each other. Okay? You gotta know how to, I know, you gotta know how to, how to read it. Yeah. That means probably hasn't been resolved yet. You don't know. Yeah, it's missing information. It's missing information. Okay. Now, here's the thing. How do we know that's the most different? I mean, I'm telling you that it's the most different, right? But why? Like, what makes it different than the other things? So it's, it's, it's not physical in nature. It's actually genetic in nature. So here, it's right over here, but I'm going to explain it, okay? You guys just did an experiment with NCBI, right? And you know how you guys are doing, you had a list of proteins, and then you had to run a blast to see if the thing aligned more with archaea or bacteria. So here's an example of that with this organism. So when you sequence Giardia's genome, and you run a blast for this gene, okay, you get the archaea version. So in other words, you run the blast, it lines up with archaea, okay? But when you look at all the other organisms in the tree, so all of these other organisms, the gene lines up with bacteria. So something must have happened at this point. What happened at this point is, is probably the following scenario. You know how we talked about the mitochondria used to be what? Yeah, so the mitochondria, so if this is the cell, this is the mitochondria, this would be the nucleus, okay? 
what happens is some of the genes from the mitochondria actually went into the nucleus. Some were lost, but some actually went into the nucleus. Okay? The ones that went into the nucleus replaced the original version. The original version was the archaea version. Yeah, very good. So what must have happened at this point is this mutation, where the bacterial version, because remember the mitochondria used to be a bacteria, not archaea, not a bacteria. And at some point, the bacterial version, which we call B, replaced the archaea version, which we call A. That would have happened at this point. Didn't happen in this group. So the common ancestor of all of these things would have basically had that mutation and would have just passed it on to all of its descendants. So that's what makes it the most different, because it doesn't have that mutation. It has the original version. Okay? Uh, questions about that? No? Okay. Uh, the next group, the discicristates. That's an interesting name. Okay? Uh, and it says that we have a disc-shaped cristae in the mitochondria. So something to do with the mitochondria. I hope you could see that from where you are. Okay, it's right here, actually. Disc-shaped mitochondria. Okay. It includes things like euglena. Recognize euglena? It's one of your, yep, one of your slides. Euglena is an interesting thing. Euglena is a type of organism that is like, it's almost like plant-like in behavior because it can make its own food. Because look what it has. Chloroplast. But it can also go out and actively eat other things. So it can do a bit of both. Okay. What is in this group are also, so this is not a parasite, but what is in this group are things that are nasty parasites. Now, there's a picture of a fly. Yeah. This fly is the, do you know what a vector is? No? Not, yeah, physics, right? Physics. Okay, yeah. sorry, in biology, a vector is an organism that transmits a disease. So the number one vector are mosquitoes, right? But this is a TT fly, and what it does is when it bites you, it transmits a type of parasite. And the parasite looks like this, and here's its name, Trypanosoma gambiense, and it causes a disease called African sleeping sickness, okay? Here you can see a child, you can see the bumps on the neck, so this child has been bitten by the fly. Parasite's gone in. The problem with the parasite is that it has the ability to get through what's called the blood-brain barrier. In other words, it can get into your brain. Once it gets into the brain, your immune system launches an attack. And uh, you know that when you get injured, one of the things that happens is the injury area swells up. What happens when your brain swells, though? That's bad. Right? You can go into coma. If that happens, now listen to this number, okay? If you start to get that symptom where your brain starts to swell, the mortality rate for this condition is 100%. There's no cure. Okay, no cure. Now, um, because you start feeling tired first, and then once you start feeling tired, the next stage, there is a milder form of this parasite where you don't get, the parasite doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, but I can't remember the name of that parasite, but this one will cross, and you go from sleepy symptoms, or well, you're not sleepy, it's just because of this parasite, to coma, which eventually becomes uh, fatal. Yeah. This is in Africa. Okay, this is, yeah, don't have to worry about it here. But honestly, we're pretty lucky. There aren't too many nasty parasites in Canada. It's more, you get, as you go closer to the equator, there's more and more of these nasty, scary parasites. Yep. Uh, that's a great question. 
I don't know if there's something to protect you against. But remember, you have to be bitten by this pretty nasty big bug. So I would imagine more like physical protection would be better, like wearing. Yeah, and I don't know. Like this is, I say I'm saying Africa, but I don't think it's everywhere in Africa. Okay, so you would have to know like what zones are. Like, do we find a lot of this uh, parasite? There is, by the way, um, and this is another picture of that parasite. So the parasite is quite small. It gets in. It can get into cells. It's tiny. It's tinier than uh, than your cells. Um, there is actually a related version. Now, this related version is called Trypanosoma cruzi, and so it's C R U Z I, and this one is in South America, and you could see the parasite here. <coughs> now this one is uh, also pretty bad, because what? And this, by the way, this is the vector. This is the uh, I think it's called the kissing bug, also known as the binchuka. And here is the name of that bug. This is an entry from a person that we studied in this class that went to South America, was attacked by this bug, and contracted that parasite. So it's very similar parasite. This one does not cause sleeping sickness. This one causes something called Chagas disease. And who do you think that famous person is? Who went to uh, South America? Yeah, Darwin. This is Darwin. This is an entry from Darwin, okay? And uh, so what, what, what this bug does, this bug actually bites you at night. So you're, and it's pretty big, it's maybe about this big. Yeah, it's quite big. You're sleeping, it comes out at night, crawls all over you, gets to your face, and bites you. Now, and you can see the swelling here. So this kid was bitten around the eyes. When it bites, though, it does something quite interesting. And what's really interesting about this is, and I don't know if I could uh, zoom in. I'm going to try to see if I can zoom in here. So you can probably see this a little bit better. So let me see. Oops, sorry. I can't see my mouse here. I'm trying to. Can you see that? So this actually, this parasite is such a problem in South America that's actually made its way onto currency. Okay, so this is a cruzado, uh, and this is the scientist uh, Cruz who studied. Study the, the disease, okay? On the currency, you now I know it's a bit blurry. If you wanted to Google the image, you'd probably get a, a much clearer picture. This actually is the bug. So the bug is actually on the currency. This is the blood stream. So what the bug does, the bug bites, parasite gets into the bloodstream. Over here, uh, I know it's probably a little hard to see. You can actually see the parasite in the digestive tract. If you get a clearer picture on Google, you will notice that the parasite actually gets pooped out. So the bug, when it bites you, it poops out the parasite. So the parasite does not get into the bite. Did I say it gets into the bite? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, don't scratch that. It doesn't get into the bite. I'm just so used to thinking that a parasite gets in through bite. Because that's what you're, you're, you're used to, right? Sorry, let, let me fix that. The parasite does not get into the bite of the bug. The parasite gets in because once it bites, it poops in a similar area. What happens is when you get bit, one of the reactions that you're going to have is you want to want to scratch it, right? When you scratch it, you actually get the parasite under the skin. So the parasite gets into the skin. After it poops, you scratch, it gets in. The parasite then actually goes into uh, heart tissue. 
it starts to divide into the in the heart cells. And just like when viruses, when they replicate, the cells die, the heart cells die. So guess what happens to someone with Chagas disease? They go into heart failure, right? Guess what Darwin died of? Yeah, heart failure. Yeah. So, anyways, I thought it. Uh yes, this is uh this is long term. I don't know how long it takes for the full blown symptoms to show up. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's Argentina, I believe. It's Argentina. Okay, next time we will continue with protests and we'll talk about Paramecia and their group, okay? So let's end there.